are we ready to get started? Welcome everybody to our GitLab Summit in South Africa. Thank you for this wonderful country and city for hosting us. The agenda today looks a little bit like this and I would like to say here that look at all these chairs and there's actually people in them. We are growing. We have some amazing members of our community here, including our team members, partners, users, contributors, and it's wonderful having everyone here today. And uh, we'll go ahead and get this started. So our values here at GitLab are very important to us. And so is our ability to scale and grow as a company and bring value to our community and to our users. As we scale and as we grow, things can be a little bit uncomfortable because growth requires evolution and evolution requires change and it requires scale. And we've already seen that just in the last, oh, I've been here for less than a year and I've already seen a lot of change. And it's wonderful to experience that change, it's wonderful to grow, but it's also uncomfortable. And when you think about evolution in life and what we go through, you can see that we've had a lot of examples of this through the world, whether you believe in traditional evolution or not, it doesn't really matter. There is proof. Uh, the Mexican cave fish is an example of an animal that's evolved. It lives in a cave. It's dark. It has no light. It no longer has eyes. It used to. They got rid of their eyes. There's some things here at GitLab have changed as well. Uh, I asked Sid what some of the things that we've lost as we've grown, and he mentioned amateur hour. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I think that it implies that we're doing things a little better now. We've got more process in place. We've got fewer bugs and mistakes as we release things, and that's not a bad thing to remove some things. There's also examples of things just changing but still being there, and Darwin's finches are an example of this. They were on an island. They had large, big beaks to get big nuts out of the trees. Well, guess what? Life changed, and they needed to have smaller beaks, and so they evolved, and now they have smaller beaks. We also have species that have developed gills so they can swim underwater. GitLab's also going through this evolution, and you see it in our FGUs being extended to every eight weeks instead of every four. Not ideal, but it's necessary. You see our team calls as we struggle through and try to figure out the best way to have those. We even switch to calling them company calls. We now do breakouts. We now do smaller groups because it's hard to connect and have 300 people uh, talk in a 30 minute call. So we're evolving that. And not all these changes will feel comfortable and not all of them will feel good, but together we can get through them. We can make the company stronger and we can continue to grow our business and our team members and our community. But as we grow and as we evolve, we don't have to forsake our values. These values are what will get us there. They are what will make us successful and continue to be successful. And as we grow and as we evolve, we need to remember these values and make sure that we're doing so in a way that we're not forsaking them. And they really will be our friend and that basic DNA we have doesn't need to change as we grow. But we're here at the summit today and we have had a great nine, 10 months since the last one. And one of the things that I love is some of the things I get to see on Twitter. I wasn't a big Twitter person until GitLab and I, I quickly realized here I need to get more familiar with social media and it's been fun. But you see on Twitter the love for GitLab from developers and community members. You see on Twitter the love of remote work and then we're doing things not just great here but we're doing it differently. And we're able to bring in 300 and 22 or 23 employee or team members I think we have in here at GitLab and I think last summit we had closer to 187. So we're growing a lot and we're being able to continue to do that in a distributed environment. And we're a case study for other companies and I, and I think we can continue to be so and, and teach others. And that's appreciated. In addition, people love our development powers, our monthly releases, how much we can cram into those releases and how much staying true to open source and we're not compromising on our desire to be open source and that's appreciated as well that we can see when we look at the, the tweets going around. But now we're at the summit and the summit is different. We're used to working in our homes or our coffee shops or our we work spaces during the week and now we're here all together and we don't get that opportunity a lot. 
And it can be overwhelming, and it can be wonderful. It can be scary, and it can be exciting. It can be exhausting and invigorating. And so I, I kind of just threw this word map together with the different kind of feelings that come with this summit. And we're all here together, and some of us are a little bit more experienced. And if you are, and you've been to a summit before, help the new, your new team members. Help them feel comfortable. Make sure they feel welcomed in groups and conversations. If you're new, then that's wonderful too, because you can bring something new to this that we might not have experienced before, and you can give us suggestions about how to make it better in the future. So there really is something we can all contribute here, and hopefully we can all have a great time. But why are we here? Why do we do this? We do this because relationships are important. And I had the ability to form a lot of strong relationships over Zoom, but actually being together with my team or with my team members and the team members here at GitLab, there's a different kind of connection that can be built. And so really spend that time here over this week building those connections and building those relationships. And make sure that that effort and that enjoyment that you get from that carries you back to the workplace and helps sustain us as we go through the rest of the year and then come together again in about another nine months. So really don't consider this a vacation, hate to say it. This really is about GitLab and being together as a community. So let's really maximize that and benefit that as much as we can. And, uh, and then weave in a little bit of the you time that you need also to make this work. So I'm going to do the fine print thing here. We represent GitLab. You saw that in some of Kirsten's emails. Thank you for getting us here, Kirsten. And, uh, but I have to remind it here too. Let's look out for each other. You look out for each other by making sure that we're safe and, and the people that you work with are safe. But you also look out for each other to kind of help make sure your team members maybe aren't making a fool of themselves. Uh, I mentioned before, for those of you who heard me talk about feedback, that I'm typically the type of person who, if you have cilantro in your teeth, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to let you walk around being embarrassed and you get back at night, look in the mirror and, wow, why did no one tell me? Uh, so it's the same way when it comes to drinking at the summit or get, having a little too much fun and maybe getting a little bit silly. Be that person who looks over to your friend and says, hey, maybe it's time to, to go back up to your room. Uh, don't help us avoid waking up with big giant regrets of embarrassment. And uh, I hate to say it, but it happens. And, and most of probably have had those moments in life where like, oh, what did I say? I'll probably have it right after this. Uh, so um, let's, let's help each other out. But also, really do make sure that you take time for you. If you need a break, if you need a rest, that's okay. Uh, I, I'm uh, myself not the most extroverted person, and I love meeting new people, and I love seeing everyone here, but I do need my downtime with my book just to refuel a little bit. That doesn't mean that I'm doing something wrong here at the summit. If you're like that too, take that time, but balance it out with each other and spending time with each other as well. So with that, I think I'm passing it off to Mike, who is our Chief Revenue Officer and ready to tell you about his journey to making it here to GitLab. Thank you, Barbie. Uh, can I have a quick show of hands? For whom is this your first GitLab Summit? That is how fast we're growing. And this is also my first summit uh, I've been here for about three months, and Sid asked me if I'd share a little bit about how I made the decision and decided to join GitLab. And it's a little awkward because the first phone call I got was from an investor of GitLab, and uh, the truth is I said, no, thank you. Uh, I don't want to talk to GitLab. I didn't understand uh, what GitLab was and where it was going, and it was a mistake that I was luckily able to remedy uh, later on. But I was partly able to remedy that because I had three criteria that I was using to decide where the right place would be to spend the next few years of my life. And I thought I'd share those three criteria and a little bit about how that ended up applying to GitLab. It starts out with a company has to have a massive market. No matter what we do with product, sales, marketing, you can't make a small market any bigger. So by giant, I mean billions and billions of dollars of opportunity, room for multiple big winners, and at least one giant winner. The second criterion was a unique advantage. This company needs to bring a unique advantage to that massive market so that you have a chance to win, because big markets bring big competition. 
Third criterion is that the company has to be worthy, worthy of its customers, worthy of the market, worthy of our teammates, and worthy of our time. And that's an important piece that makes spending that investment over the next four, 10, 15 years with that company worthwhile. So for all of those to matter, I feel that the company also has to be on a mission. And that's a mission to be successful, unstoppable. There's a relentless pursuit that goal. And I believe we are on that mission at Gale Lab. So let's talk a little bit about the massive market. When I talk about the massive market, um, I talk to an investor, I spent some time with Sid and read the handbook. And I don't know if any of you had the same reaction I did. I said, wow, this is a really interesting business. That was my first takeaway. The second takeaway was, wow, there's a lot of detail in this handbook. <laughs> I will admit I have not read every page yet. I think we're up to about 1,400 pages now. Um, still working on it. But uh, I will get there. And uh, hopefully some of you will slow down in creating new pages, just enough for me to catch up. But when I applied those three criteria to GitLab, uh, I decided to call an investor. And this investor happened to be on the board of a major competitor of ours, multi-billion dollar company. And I was calling to get two things. Number one, validate all of the numbers that Sid had shared with me about how enormous this market was. Number two, I wanted to hear all of the reasons why GitLab couldn't be successful, how they were going to crush GitLab, how they were going to, he said, stop. We don't even need to keep going. You should join GitLab. Okay, that was not what I expected. I was ready for you to tell me all the reasons why you were going to beat GitLab. He said, GitLab's doing great. They are on to something. You should go there. He said, on a mission, they have an awesome company, and there's no way that this market is going to get any smaller. We see it keep getting bigger every day. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what a big market is. Take hired car transportation, taxis, rental cars, Uber, Lyft. This is a $60 billion market. Most companies sell into markets like this by selling products and services to help that existing business. An example might be dispatch software. Lyft could have said, hey, let's sell a better way for all of the riders to book a ride. Best case, that's a $200 million market. Maybe you get 40% market share if you do a great job. That's $80 million. That's great, but it's $80 million. Instead, Uber and Lyft said, uh, let's do, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. Let's look at GitLab. GitLab in the DevOps market could pursue say, license management. We can sell license management to companies, and there's companies that sell every single one of these stages of the DevOps lifecycle. That would be a $500 million opportunity. Oh, maybe that's $200 million in revenue if you get 40% market share. Not bad. But like Lyft and Uber, they decided to actually upend the whole thing and run the entire business. They have grown in just a matter of a few years to where they now have 72.5% of the market share and the rental car companies now actually serve their business. They rent cars to drivers for Uber and Lyft. So they now do 40 billion in revenue and have 72% of the market. That's a lot better than 80 million. For us, we're doing the same thing. We're going after the whole market. We're gonna take a much better way to attack DevOps and prove the development process, help our customers deliver products, make developers happier, and help all those companies to save money at the same time. So even a 10% uh, market share of what is now a $20 billion opportunity, that means $2 billion in sales. $2 billion in sales, even at modest multiples, makes a company $15 to $25 billion in market cap. That's a big market. I also decided to take a look at other companies that have been really successful. So if you've spent time with Sid, you know there's a lot that I got to learn in those first few conversations. I took some of that data and applied it to look at all of the IPOs in the enterprise in the last seven years. And this starts on the left and goes to the right of companies that were at the same stage as us when they were $10 million in revenue, how fast were they growing? 20 million, 40, 60, when they had 100 million in revenue, were they growing at 70%, 50%, 30%? The green line there is the 80th percentile. That's some of the best IPOs in enterprise technology. Wanted to see how we compared, but why not to 80%? How about the 90th percentile? The 
pieces of technology. Okta, Workday, Twilio, Box, these are companies that grew north of 100% for a very long time and continued at 80 to 90% of growth even once they were north of $100 million in revenue. When I compared GitLab to those companies, we're actually on a path to be at or above those kind of companies. That's the cohort that we are in. This is a rare opportunity. I didn't feel it until I had those conversations with Sid. I didn't believe it until I spent the time digging into this. This is a rare place, and there's not many opportunities that you get in your career to have a product that fits a market that's this big with a team that can actually pursue it. So in order to pursue that giant market, you have to have a unique advantage. Clearly the numbers show that we have something. We have a unique advantage. And what I found is that first and foremost, we have an amazing product that people love. Across all stages of DevOps, people would say we're crazy. How would you possibly deliver all stages of the DevOps lifecycle? Starting to hear from the customers, they not only love that story, love that direction, they believe that we're gonna deliver it. They already are using pieces of that life cycle with us, and they know that we're gonna chip away at every other piece of the life cycle. And before I joined, uh, I called some customers, and they had that passion, but I got to feel it firsthand. Went to New York, spent some time with a large financial services customer. They bought 1,000 seats of premium in March of this year. I was meeting with them in June. In June, they had already deployed all 1,000 seats, and they said they need more seats. Two weeks later, I was in London, got to meet with the same company again, different office in London. At that point, in addition to more seats, they wanted to begin a proof of concept for Ultimate. This is a company that went from first purchase to fully deployed to needing more seats to evaluating the highest tier that we offer in a matter of three and a half months. That is also a very rare thing. In my career, I've spent a lot of time helping companies to catch up to deployment, helping them to catch up to what we thought we were going to be able to accomplish. This is the opposite. We're trying to catch up with how quickly they can move with our product. You should be really proud of what you've built. Some customers already pay more than a million dollars a year for what this team has built. That's a lot of money, and that shows that they really get a lot of value of what you've built. The distributed model of GitLab, I think, is something that many people have questions about. It's how I had the first conversation with Sid. I wanted to believe and understand how this company could make a 3,000, 5,000 person company and be a public company with a fully distributed model. I left that conversation completely convinced that this company can make that happen. It takes a unique approach and we've got that. We don't have to fight for talent in Silicon Valley. We get to compete for the very best talent everywhere in the world. We get to select from a talent pool of billions of people. That's a big advantage. We get a more productive workplace. We get more diverse insight, more diverse people, more diverse input into our product. We're able to support our customers wherever they are in the world. We're already in 40 countries. Those top IPOs I showed you, the most diverse geographic companies have offices in about 18 countries. We're already in a much more distributed approach in how we can reach our market. We're also frugal and don't burn a lot of money. That means that every dollar we take in, we get two, maybe three times the benefit that our competitors do. That's a big In order to go on a mission, you need a fearless leader. I had to make this, uh, this slide, but I think a story will help a little bit. Sid and I were in New York together, meeting with customers, and we met with a large financial services company uh, down on Wall Street. And those of you that have spent time in New York, Wall Street's actually a pretty long drive from Midtown uh, in the middle of the day. Let's call it Megabank. We were at Megabank. And Megabank loved what Sid was saying. They wouldn't let us leave. It was awkward because we had to get up to Midtown for another meeting with another large bank. The car was in the fire lane. It was going to leave. We're walking out, and they were literally tugging on Sid's sleeves. It was a physical grab. It was kind of uncomfortable. Sid, I just want to hear a little bit more about CI. And says, I'm sorry, we'll have to follow up later, but we have to go. So we entered the hallway, and I said, hey, one second, I just need to hit the men's room. We'll head downstairs and grab the car. 
And Sid said, no. No time for bathrooms, we're leaving. And I didn't know what to say. And before I could say anything, the customer from Megabank turned to me and said, wow, so that's what it's like to work at GitLab. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, what the heck, we're on a mission, let's go. Went downstairs, and to be fair, we got in the car and Sid said, that was a big mistake, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we're late, we're trying to get to Midtown, I'm just trying to get going. And all that was going through my mind was, this is awesome. This guy is so focused and so relentless that he's going to break through every possible obstacle. He's also going to iterate on the way and it's okay to use bathrooms, so we've got that cleared up. <laughs> but that's the kind of leader that helps us to go get the entire DevOps market, the Uber and Lyft size market. That's why investors are queued up trying to put their money to work at a company like this that can put it to work in ways that nobody else can. Finally, I wanted a company that was worthy. And by worthy, I mean not just worthy of customers' time, worthy of the investment everybody puts into it, but a worthy investment of my time that I can feel like we can make the world a little bit better while we're taking that big opportunity on. And with great success, you can do both. And I found an example when you think of companies that have actually done this. For those of you that are familiar with Salesforce.com, Salesforce is the number one company on Fortune's list of best companies to work for. They're also the fastest growing cloud company in the history of cloud. They do almost 10 billion in ARR. 10 billion in ARR, we're working on that. I know the sales team's gonna get that soon. But they've also delivered over $230 million of donations in dollars to nonprofits. They've delivered 3.1 million volunteer hours from their teams. And they've got a commitment that they deliver 1% of their equity, 1% of their profit, and 1% of their time to make the world a better place while they continue to be successful. And they can do both. And I'm confident that GitLab is the kind of place that can do both because we're showing the world a better way to work. I believe that my kids are going to work in a distributed company someday, and it's gonna be the model that that company learned from GitLab. We can be the number one on Forbes Best Place to Work list. Um, we can show our customers a better way to work as well. We're showing them how they can develop faster. They can actually have higher quality and better security while also delivering more quickly for their customers. End of the day, that makes their customers happier and it makes their team members happier. We're open. A lot of companies use this as a buzzword. For us, I believe it's a foundation and I think that foundation is so important because we're able to collaborate with our community. That community is our customers, it's our contributors, it's our users, it's our team in here, it's our significant others, our friends and partners who've joined us here today. That open approach is what gives us leverage. Again, closed companies can't copy that. There's not a way that they can get that advantage that we have. And finally, a company has to live its values. I have seen firsthand since I've joined that we live the values that Sid shared with me when we first started talking about, uh, about GitLab. And when I go watch my one-on-ones with Sid, which are on YouTube, in 10 years, my kids will see these, these one-on-ones and they'll see how we ran this business, that we achieved that success in the right way. And that's gonna make me proud to be a part of this. So when I joined, I knew that we had to take advantage of all three of these opportunities. Massive market, we needed to have a unique advantage and be able to do that uh, in a worthy way. Everything we need is in place, which leaves one thing, and that's execution. So that means it's down to us. I knew that when I was joining, that every day, every hour, every bit of effort that I put into this business can help us get to success, and that's fun for me. I enjoy knowing that the work I do can get us to that massive success. We're not held up by the market. We're not held up by an inefficient approach. We're not held up by a company that can't scale to the level we need to. That's fun for me. So uh, I think it's a fun way to work. I want to do two quick things before I close here. Number one, if you are not a GitLab employee, you're a, a significant other, partner, friend, customer, otherwise not 
uh, on the core uh, GitLab team. Can you raise your hand real quick? So this is the community. This is in this room. There's already people here who are not in the core part of GitLab, and that's because GitLab is the whole community. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us and be a part of this community and being on this journey with us, being on this mission. Thank you for taking that time. And second, I want to thank all of you, including Sid, Dimitri, and all the GitLabbers for letting me uh, join you on this massive and worthy mission. I'm excited about it, and I'm looking forward to the time ahead. So onward, and we're going to go get the $40 billion. Thank you, Mike. That was absolutely awesome. I want to quickly hit on the uh, progress we made since uh, the last summit. That's not a year ago. That's nine months ago. And we more than doubled our AR. We're making it super hard for Mike to catch up to our hand. That the onboarding actually got better. That is rare. Like the bigger the company bets, the more confusing it mostly is. So we're trying to keep up there. So everyone keep writing that, keep refactoring that, keep making it shorter, say it as fiercely as you can. I'm really, really proud of our infrastructure team uh, migrating GitLab.com to uh, Google's cloud without incident. That is. <laughs> We've come a long way. Um, and there's going to be hiccups along the road, but uh, we now have the team and the processes in place to get there. And we're still on track to ship the complete DevOps lifecycle by this year. We went from just Dev to DevOps, and we're on track to do that in a year. That is unprecedented, and I'm very proud of everyone who's contributing. I did a customer tour recently, and I learned a couple of things. In New York, I learned that nobody knows what we're doing. Literally, not a, zero cu not a single customer. And every one of them, we went in and we asked, like, hey, do you know what we're doing? And they said, yeah, yeah, we read your blog. We're the biggest fans in the company of you. We totally know what you're doing. And then, oh, we're like, oh, great, we don't have to tell them. And it turns out they think we do version control and a bit of CI. We're going so fast that the world has a hard time catching up. And we got to keep telling that story. We're a single application for the whole DevOps lifecycle. In London, I, we learned that people really want that. They need that. They told the story of a programmer that joined the company, sat down, saw the tools they had to use. After a few hours, he got up and he walked out the door. A really talented programmer, they spent a lot of time and money to recruit, just didn't like their tool set. We want a GitLab to be the thing where you walk into a company, and if it's not GitLab, you get up and walk away. <laughs> In Amsterdam, a financial services company said, yeah, we're thinking about hiring some Ruby developers just to work on GitLab. What? Yeah, we know you help us, and when we ask for a feature, you make it in a couple of months. But it's so essential to our, what we do, we want it in a couple of weeks. So we'll hire the people and we'll contribute it. If we can pull that off, if we can co-create with our customers, there is no way anyone can catch up to that. So let's make that happen. November 18, 2020, we're going to IPO. And the first step on that journey is to end next year at 100 million ARR. Mike said, yeah, I know. The projection said 97, so I kind of had the feeling you'll say this. So, sorry, Mike, we rounded it up. <laughs> we're going to IPO because we're a transparent company. What is more transparent than me? And we picked this because 
Paul said, look, I'm not super comfortable with 2020. And we're like, yeah, but we set that date in 2015, so we gotta hit it. It's like, okay, let's do the latest possible date in the year. And let's do a Wednesday, because that's a good date for IPOs. There's even CFOs are sometimes slightly um, superstitious. Um, maybe he has data. Um, and let's do it before Thanksgiving. Before, because after Thanksgiving, everything is closed. And I like picking a date. Like, this is crazy. No, no company picked the year of the IPO five years in advance. No company picked the date more than two years in advance. No one's, if we hit this, no one's ever done this before. We do it because it's efficient. It's efficient in small, medium, and large ways. In a very small way, me and Kirsten got our World Trade Center uh, observatory deck tickets refunded. Uh, we, uh, we visit customers in New York on Saturday. We were going to be on a plane and a few hours before we were going to visit the highest deck in New York overlooking the city and we came in and they said, sorry, it's foggy, you can't go. We're like, totally cool, understand, thanks for telling us, can we have our money back please? And he said, no, you can reschedule. We're like, we're on a plane in a few hours, we can't reschedule. They're like, tough luck, just make it work. So Kirsten was going to see whether we could hand off the tickets to someone else. I said, no, I know a date I'll be here. <laughs> it will be either ringing the bell at Wall Street or pushing the button in Times Square for the NASDAQ. And it will be a bit busy on that Wednesday, but on Saturday I'll make some time to visit here. So can you please put it in for the Saturday after November 2020. And the guy goes in his computer, he's doing it. He's like, 2020? <laughs> he's like, the registration system goes six months out. I said, I'd like my money back, please. <laughs> and we got our money back, so. <laughs> in a medium way, the if you start prepping for your IPO two years in advance, it's gonna cost half the money as it costs when you need to do it in a year. The more time you have, the more efficient the process. And we're all about efficiency, so that helps. The biggest benefit about agreeing as a company on a goal is that you can stop arguing about the goal. You can stop discussing that. And you can start discussing how to achieve it. Because this is not gonna be easy. It's gonna take each and every one of us. And we get, for the next two and a half years, we can spend our time get, figuring out how to get there. This became uh, also deeply personal for me. I was with family and I told this date. And my uncle said, why did you pick this date? Did you know? I'm like, what are you talking about? The CFO picked the date. He's like, no, this would have been the hundred birthday of your granddad, your grandfather. I'm like, what? My grandfather, he was very influential in our family, but not only that, he has, he's the same title as me, he's a chartered engineer in the Netherlands, and his full name is Sietserin Sibrandi, and if you can spell that, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> as me. So when he passed away, it, it felt like part of me was dying because like, my name and title was in, in, in the newspaper and, and everyone talked about that. So if we manage to hit that date, it will be a great celebration of his life as well. I want to hit on two things. Our best decisions are taken despite management, are taken despite me. In finance, there's this concept, in order to have an advantage, you not only have to be right, it has to be non-consensus. Everyone else has to think something else. For us, a single application was a ridiculous idea. Camille came to Dimitri and said, we gotta do this, we gotta get, integrate GitLab CI with GitLab, it'd be so much better. And Dimitri was like, no, many sharp tools, like it needs to be separate, or our monolith is too big to begin with, let's not do that. And at a certain point he relented and Dimitri came to me and I said, come on, Dimitri, he laughed him out of the room. It doesn't make sense. And we, 
I re we relent it because it's more efficient. It's more efficient to build code that way. It, it would save us some time releasing. But it ended up being so much better of a user experience. One UI, one concept of the user, one data store, one way to service information, a way for a whole company to collaborate, to be on the same page. That was not a decision from the top. Six years ago, to this day, this day is six years ago, I launched GitLab, the company, with a show Hacker News Post. And we were going to make all our money with .com, not with self-managed. All the money would come for .com. We know how that turned out for, so far. We're going to make money with .com, but we built this company, as we're here now, on our self-managed installation. So we got to iterate. We got to listen to users. And we require you to disagree and commit, but we don't require you to stop disagreeing. Barbie is, keeps disagreeing with me on certain subjects she cares about and championing them. That's expected of every single one in this company because we're not the smartest guys in the room. We're not the smartest girls in the room. You have to tell us what is right because you know because you're on the front lines. The other thing is we're really proud of what we do, what we achieve, and that's great. But we need to start getting proud about what we enable our users to do. If you look at a release post today, it's us saying what we shipped. There's not a single customer in there. There's not a single person that achieved some, something with our software. It's got to stop being about us. It's got to start being about what we enable our users to do. Now, every summit, I do a challenge. And the inspiration for this challenge was when Dimitri tried to use our own product. He needed a new Rails app, and he wanted to use other DevOps. And guess what? It didn't work. It doesn't have database migrations. It doesn't have HTTPS. It's not practical. We got to ship something we want to use ourselves. So the challenge is make something that you want to use, but that's too, that's too easy because you can just say you'll use it. So we'll have someone that will be the judge of that. He's right there. His name is Greg. He's Barbie's husband. And he's full of amazing stories. Ask him when he messed up in Steve Jobs' office. Like, great, great stories. You got to convince him to move from GitHub, because shamefully he's still on there. <laughs> But guess what? We're shipping software that even our co-founder can't use. So low level of shame for us, too. Every day, you'll present to Greg what other DevOps can do for him. And he's, he, I'm very sure he'll come up with great suggestions. Work with him and convince him to move. The second part of the summit is generating more leads. We want people that are on GitLab core and are interested more to raise their hands. We're not going to put up an email paywall or an email gate before our downloads. We want people to raise their hands themselves. So we're going to put a menu item in GitLab. Because the installation has more than 100 users, we offer a free health check for our services people will engage. Ship that. If you're interested in volunteering for any of this, so this takes not just engineers, it also takes marketing, it takes sales, it takes services. Get here on the podium after everything is ended. Talk with Greg, or if you can't make that because of your excursion, join the channel. Now, if you complete both challenges, me and Karen will give a fitness lesson at our closing ceremony. And I will wear my giraffe suit, which I bought for the GitLab end party that night. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Mark. He's going to do some story time about our product vision. So yeah, um, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, GitLab's product vision. 
Uh, really, at this point, I think hopefully most of you know what our vision is. I mean, Michael and Sid just talked about it, right? We're really close to delivering the complete DevOps lifecycle all in a single application. And, uh, and Josh, now oh, there he is, he's actually working on a demo of um, you know, where we got so far up to and including GitLab 11.2. Um, Josh, you wanna come up here and give a demo? Just kidding, no, he doesn't have a demo ready. But he's gonna record it, and then you guys can all watch that later. Um, and I'm sure we'll get a blog post out there giving everybody you know, a progress update on where we're at. But what I thought would be a little bit more interesting would be talk a, you know, a little bit of the backstory. You know, how do we get to this product vision? So with that, it's story time. When I first heard of GitLab, I was working at a developer tools company. Um, and we had just delivered a, an integration with GitHub. And one of our customers had uh, asked to do a GitLab integration as well. I was like, GitLab, what's that? So I took a look and uh, you know, looked at the project. And no offense, Dimitri, but it, it was an ugly knockoff, open source GitHub. You know, it just it was like, why, why would I bother doing this? So I ignored it and forgot about it. A couple years later, uh, I was working at a different developer tools company. And one of the product managers that worked for me was really excited about this competitor, GitLab. And he'd say things like, GitLab's got CI now. And you know, their entire roadmap is open and public. Now that's kind of crazy. So I you know, kind of ignored him though, because like, why would you care about this you know, small little knockoff? And at most, it's a you know, third-rate competitor. You know, we're not going to do anything like that. It wasn't worth it. Just kind of ignored it. But a couple of months of him just raving about GitLab, and I mean, he was excited. He was irrationally excited about GitLab. And so I finally relented, and I took another look. And it was immediately apparent things had changed. And like, it wasn't just an ugly knockoff of GitHub anymore. I mean, first off, it wasn't even ugly. It looked really nice now. And it actually had more functionality than GitHub. I mean, not just that it had CI, but like the actual version control was better. Um, lots of functionality GitHub didn't ship for years after that. So this was really interesting. How did this happen? So I dug in a little bit and I was like, oh, you joined Y Combinator. There's actually a company now behind this and they've got investors and they're really digging in. They're still a small team, but really, really knocking it out of the park. They were just crushing it. And then I started to dig in a little bit more and, uh, and then I came across the, the handbook. And this is actually a screenshot from uh, the values page. And um, just to show that it looks actually different than our values today. Just like everything at GitLab, we iterate on that. But that's what our values were um, a couple years ago. So I took a look at that and like everything, you know, was much, much smaller. But even, you know, our mission, our values, uh, our roadmap, everything was just public and open source. And, this came to me at a time when I was kind of getting frustrated with other startups that weren't writing down their values, assuming they even knew what their values were. And here, you know, GitLab had open sourced it, along with everything else about their handbook. And the last thing is I found out that they were remote first. And even though I, I worked in the Bay Area, um, I really hated commuting to San Francisco. I actually didn't want to be locked into San Francisco anyway. And so all this stuff really, really intrigued me. And so I reached out to Yob, and then started chatting with Sid. And I realized not only was this company doing really well, but there was also like a ton of ambition behind it. And so I started to open up about all the things that I wanted to do in the developer space. And it was we were shockingly you know, surprised how much Sid and I were on the same page but what we wanted to do. And uh, all these things that at other companies, you know, I, I wanted to do all this stuff and just ran into a wall. Well, at GitLab, there was no wall. You know, we had already started to, you know, move from version control into CI, and we're well poised to go from CI into CD. And, uh, you know, so this just really, really got me exciting. And, you know, spoiler alert, I joined the company. Um, and actually, when I joined the company, Sid, to his credit, 
told me to kind of take it easy. Really just get to know the team, absorb the culture, you know, just kind of soak it in. But I was so excited that within two weeks I had written up a complete vision for CICD at GitLab. And it had everything I had ever dreamed of as a developer, anything that I had ever thought of in this space. But for the first time I was seeing that maybe, just maybe, this company could actually pull it off. And so we implemented environments and deployments and pipelines and slowly worked through the vision, you know, picking off these major chunks of the developer workflow. Well, actually, that's a lie. I say slowly, but we were shipping major chunks of this at a furious pace. I mean, really iterating quicker than I had ever imagined. I was actually really, really proud of the team for what they were able to deliver. Um, you know, kicking out these, these major iterations so quickly. And, and I actually came from companies where I was really proud of how fast we iterated. But, uh, you know, things that would take, you know, a company maybe you know, almost up to a year just to sort of plan things out and slot them into a release and then talk to customers, et cetera. Like, all these things take time and yeah, we were just shipping things in months. It was really, truly really amazing. And then about a year ago, we had covered so much of the CI-CD uh, workflow that we started running into a wall. See, as a developer, I had always thought that it was really important to cover this entire scope from idea to production. And then maybe when you got to production, you'd do a little monitoring to make sure you didn't break anything when you shipped it. But truly, you know, operations, like that was on the other side of a wall. You know, we were making developer tools. This was a developer company. Operations, that's clearly a separate thing. Or is it? Maybe this isn't a wall. Maybe, you know, there's nothing there. Maybe it's imaginary. And I felt just like, you know, Neo in the Matrix swallowing the red pill and eyes open and I see that there's no wall. And with that, GitLab was moving into DevOps. So within a month or two, Sid and I and others had crafted a vision for 2018 where GitLab goes beyond dev into DevOps. But not just any DevOps, the complete DevOps lifecycle where we ship something for every major part of software development and operations, all within a single application. Because did I mention GitLab's ambitious? Now to cover something this big, we knew we were going really into breadth over depth territory. I mean, as a user experience centric, you know, PM, this is really uncomfortable. I mean, we're shipping a lot of these minimum viable changes or MVCs, and they really kind of amount to like a foundation or scaffolding, but you know, pretty bare bones. But by getting the entire vision out there, everybody can understand internally and externally People can see where we're going. And then the community can help flesh it out. And now customers are even hiring people to help flesh this out. And so together, we can iterate to a lovable product. You know, not just a minimum viable product anymore, but a lovable product. As a side note, um, Sid at one point told me, don't worry, we'll ship the breadth of DevOps in 2018, and the next year we can worry about the depth. And I kind of quickly responded, yeah, right, next year we'll do DevSecOps, and then we'll have even more scope. Well, it turns out it was wrong, because it didn't take a whole year. Two months later, Sid's like, security's really important, and we started to talk about DevSec and BizOps. <laughs> I don't even think it was 2018 yet, and we had already started doing that. So anyway, back to the story. Um, the thing is, the vision is working. Prospects love it. When we talk to customers, their eyes light up. People really want this. They love the vision. Sometimes they're skeptical, but they want it. They want it to exist. And this product, the entire scope of the software development lifecycle, it's what I've always wanted as a developer. I didn't want to have to make it myself, but I wanted it to exist. But no other company could do this. Now, it's not like they didn't have the time or money or people to do it, but they didn't have the drive, ambition, determination, whatever. 
They all put up imaginary walls. At GitLab, there is no wall. Of course we can do this. And not only can we do this, we have an obligation to do this. This product needs to exist. Many people could have done it, but we were the only ones that could accept that low level of shame with ship rate, shipping you know, small iterations so quickly. And we're the only ones that have the guts to do it. There is no wall. We tore down the wall between version control and CI. We're tearing down the wall between dev and ops. And if you think there's some magic wall around DevOps, think again. There is no wall. I mean, what's next? Designers, product managers, executives? Yeah, they're all fair game. Because remember, our mission is everyone can contribute. And we're building on the strengths of an ever-expanding software development lifecycle. But there are no limits. There is no wall. And the funny thing is about imaginary walls, when you're on the other side, and you look back and you realize, like, what was I afraid of? There is no wall. Okay, so uh, we're, again, talking details now, the fine print. We're all going out to our excursions after this, and it should be a wonderful day. We've got Table Mountain, we've got Robin Island, we've got wine tasting, we have penguins, we have cultural tours, whatever you chose uh, in your most recent Slack channel for this event, which is Summit Announcements. It'll have a list of what you chose and what time it's leaving. The first group to go is Robin Island. You will need your passports or you will not be getting on the boat. So make sure you have those and you should already have your red wristband from, from Kirsten and you are leaving first. So the times on those sheets are not the time that you should start thinking about showing up. They are the times the bus will pull away. So if you are going to Robin Island, you will need to make sure you're on that bus and ready to go by 11 and there's lunches to pick up and you should know your details. And right now we're going to go ahead and have those who are going to participate with the challenge. You do have some time to come up here. We have finished in good time. But with that, I also, given that we have finished in good time, are there any questions that you would like to ask anyone from the leadership team before you go on? I'm speaking. No? So if you're going to Robin Island, start asking questions, you're not leaving. <laughs> My favorite color? <laughs> wow, that's an easy one, red. <laughs> Why? Because it's the color for passion and love and living and life. Oh. I'm too afraid of Kirsten to answer that question. <laughs> okay, so in the top nine months, what are the biggest, not last nine months, biggest win? Uh, I will say that I don't like this answer because it's not very um, globally, but I would say getting us off of Trina so quickly. Um, I've never seen such a Herculean effort, and I know not everyone understands this, but Trina's very, very expensive, and when you get to a larger employee number, it doesn't make sense to be using them at all. Uh, and to be able to roll off of that so quickly and to get new benefits in place that are more um, advantageous to our workforce in terms of higher coverage levels and higher benefit plans and adding services that we didn't have before, like infertility treatments, which I'm really happy that we were able to do. Uh, but to do all that so quickly was an absolute Herculean effort by Brittany and the whole team. So way to go, People Ops team, you did great. We have a mic up here, I thought. Yeah, there we go. Is that one working? All right, there we go. Um, for me, I think the biggest win, I'm gonna actually blend into a couple of things, because the most important thing that I've seen, even in these three months, has been the shift in both the conversation with customers and the way they've been thinking about our business from source control to complete DevOps. 
And in that three months, I've seen customers move from what we've been talking about as a vision to them actually understanding that vision. And I think what Sid described as our customers don't understand that, that's the biggest win is when they finally get that understanding. Um, I was in Washington DC uh, a couple of weeks ago with a large government organization that is already a customer, but they are moving from their first 500 seats to their next 500 seats. In that conversation, we went through their top budget priorities. And they said there's actually not top priorities, there's only three. Our entire budget is allocated for number one, time to market, number two, uptime, high availability, number three, and I actually called number three number five, security. And they called it number five is because security is not allowed to block number one or number two. And all three of those, their entire budget allocation is what we do. When you talk about complete DevOps, that actually addresses the entire spend, the top three priorities they have in their organization. That's the biggest win for me is when I see this vision actually being understood by customers. And that particular customer has now moved from a conversation of adding the next 500 to another 4,000 users because they can actually benefit from all of those capabilities across all of their users. So I know that Paul's gonna bring that one in. We already put it in the commit, so uh, looking forward to that one, Paul. Cool, thanks for the question. The, the most significant thing we did is our number one goal at the company. We hit our incremental ACV numbers. As long as we keep doing that, we can deal with a lot of other stuff going off the rails. The thing that was most broken at GitLab was GitLab.com. And we now have the team and the processes in place to make GitLab.com ready for mission critical applications. So that would be my number two thing. The number three thing was we scaled. Like nothing got majorly broken. Like we managed to recruit the people we wanted to recruit. Finance managed to keep up and keep closing the books sometimes even a bit faster. Like all the different things that can break at the company if you're more than doubling every year, they didn't happen, as far as I can tell, which is also starting to become a problem as we go bigger. But it's amazing that you're going at this breakneck speed and not everything is on fire. So those would be my three highlights for the, for the last nine months. Thanks for that question. Mark, you wanna give your top three? So actually, Michael kind of stole my first one. Uh, obviously, the, the DevOps vision is a big important thing for me. But for me, the, what was really exciting was uh, really aligning around that. You know, nine months ago, we sort of had some bubbling ideas about what this meant. But having the entire organization, you know, not just the product side and engineering, but sales and marketing, everything, and our customers in particular, really rallying around this. That that was really big. Um, and the other one, kind of alluded to, and actually, Michael kind of slipped that in um, during his talk, but we have people paying us more than a million dollars. Like that is really, like it's great to have the aggregate number, but individual customers paying us more than a million dollars, that's huge, that's a big milestone for me at least. And the last thing is, uh, um, was it you, was it you? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the other thing was it's iteration, I'll just give a shout out to that. Um, everything at GitLab iterates, not just the product team, the company, our values iterated, I showed that before, but as we've grown to 300 plus people now, what's amazing is we haven't gone through a period where just everything falls apart. I've been at companies where that happens, 100 people, you gotta reorg, everything goes wrong. 200 people, you gotta reorg again because everything you just did, now it doesn't work anymore. And somehow we've iterated our way and just everything just has gotten better and continuously improved all the way up here. And I don't see any reason that that's not going to you know, keep going. Um, so that, that's a big one for me. Any other questions? Okay, anything, any other questions? No, we, we met our uh, goal of three, so we're good? Okay. <laughs> Okay, oh, I love this I question. Feel it's a big milestone. How do we make sure it's not the end all? Thank you, Clement, for that. <laughs> I was going to 
be untransparent about that one because uh, Barbie told me, hey, that everyone knows there's a world beyond that. I said, no, I, I got you covered, Barbie. Nine months before the IPO, we'll start shifting the vision. We'll say, hey, the IPO is just a step along the way. Our next goal is, and we'll think of something that makes McBride uncomfortable, probably like <laughs> billion dollars, AR, or something like that. We'll think of the next milestone beyond that. So you're going to see us focusing on IPO, but it's just a step along the way. It's just another fundraising event. And before the IPO actually happens, we'll already have put our sight on the next thing. So the IPO is not our end goal. Investors didn't invest in our company to IPO and that's it and we're gone. They, they want to buy stock at IPO. They think we're going to go a really long way. It's a $20 billion market. Best case, you get 40% of it. Macro dies down a bit, 10x multiplier. You can all do the math. That's, that's a really, really big and valuable company. And that's what we're out to build. We're not, we're not here to IPO. We're here to build an enduring software company. We're going to do that by creating a whole lot of value for our users and then capturing a tiny portion of that. Thank you so much. And with that, let's go and have some fun this, this week.